Before we get going, uh, just a quick show of hands. Uh, how many people have used Bigtable in some form or fashion? Oh, cool, cool. All right, some some of you, not not uh, not a, not a whole lot. Um, let me ask it a different way. How many folks have used YouTube, Gmail, Maps in the last 24 hours, hour? It's what you're doing right now. All right, uh, it's okay. I, I attend a lot of talks. I do the same thing. So, um, so yeah, Google uh, Cloud Bigtable is essentially the power, or Bigtable, I should say, maybe specific here. Bigtable as a technology is uh, behind uh, pretty much all of Google's multi-billion user services. So there are multiple services at Google that exceed a billion user counts uh, or in terms of active users. And to support that, Bigtable is behind the scenes. So if that sounds interesting to you and you want to do something similar or want to know how it's done, uh, you're in the right place. My name is Sami Zuhur dean I'm a senior solutions architect on the Google Cloud Platform team. I'm um, joined today uh, shortly on stage by David Mighton, who's the founder and CEO of Server Density, and Anthony Fox, who is a lead developer at GeoMesa and director of data science at uh, CCRI. All right, uh, just quick agenda of today. Uh, I'll go through an introduction. I know it's a 300-level course, so we will talk about some definitely refined uh, patterns for how to use uh, Bigtable effectively, uh, but it always helps to sort of baseline and get everybody on the same page in terms of terminology and descriptions of the service and how you interact with it. So we'll go quickly through that and then start getting into the, some of the more complex use cases and uh, patterns you should look for. So um, Google had to deal with a lot of data. It continuously has to deal with a lot of data given its mission. Uh, so. What that means is if you look at different data types, you have so many different kinds of semi-structured or uh, unstructured data types, and uh, they're not exactly you know, confining to a certain schema, a certain rigidity. Um, things like this, uh, geographic information, per-user per information, click information, URL contents, all of these are essentially semi-structured uh, structured information that sort of has an infinite tail to it. I think that's kind of the key thing to think about. They have a unknown dimensionality ahead of time, and they have sort of like a huge long tail in terms of how much data could be coming in. So you might be dealing with arbitrarily huge amounts of data, you know, upwards of excess of a petabyte. Um, and if you think about the use cases of things like um, Gmail or Maps or whatnot, um, you need to have pinpoint accuracy in terms of speed to be able to get with that. So Google had to deal with this challenge if it was going to solve a lot of the product challenges that it needed to deal with in its consumer products. Released the big table as a design implementation early in 2004 uh, and then talked about it in 2005. The paper originally came, or finally came out um, in 2006. And uh, at that time, there was applications like uh, web crawling that were essentially a search engine uh, that were using a Google Earth, Google Analytics, other products. Uh, but it quickly became sort of like a necessary staple of the diet within many of Google services. So what is Bigtable? Uh, essentially, it's NoSQL, so you're not dealing with um, predefined data types along well-known uh, you know, column definitions. You're dealing with essentially effectively a key value store. Um, large data sets, uh, and, and like I said, we're talking about things that are you know, potentially thousands of attributes or hundreds of attributes um, unknown ahead of time, and then potentially just have a long tail, things that could grow uh, to some speed. And high throughput, um, and why that's important, we'll talk about that in a second. The Bigtable family tree, so this is in Google fashion, I just showed the paper that was released around 2006. And so um, that's just a paper that's put out um, much like the GFS paper or uh, MapReduce paper, and that turns around and influences the community. Uh, so one of the things that influenced uh, was Apache HBase. And so, um, but then if you study Apache Cassandra and Accumulo and Hypertable, all these folks either directly or uh, all these projects either directly or indirectly inherited from uh, what was described in the Bigtable paper. And the Bigtable paper is just one of many, um, so this kind of gives you a feel for, uh, this is all publicly available at research.google.com under publications, uh, and, it, and we're generally pretty, ex, you know, uh, uh, discoverable in terms of Google does a, uh, a good job of putting out the things that we are working on internally, at least in some sort of academic form um, that can be turned around and ingested and turned into a project like Hadoop. Uh, and in some cases, uh, they become uh, first party offerings. And so this isn't really time horizon correct. This is just an example of the fact that it's in some cases now, especially under the Google Cloud 
umbrella, it's not enough to simply talk about certain technologies. Um, it, there is a certain expectation that there's an operational um, uh, heritage that goes behind running these services that becomes necessary if you're going to bring these projects, uh, products to, to some sort of useful bear for customers. And so um, the papers that were shown on the previous slide essentially influence, if not affect, uh, the, the Google products you see in front of you. The difference here is like we've been running these services. Google has been running these services that, as described and as written by, uh, by Google, uh, internally for 10 years. So there's a lot of operational know-how that goes into knowing how to run uh, essentially a worldwide database or a worldwide storage system um, that operates at a very fast clip. OK, so we talked about Bigtable as an academic paper, Bigtable as in its usage internally, and now Cloud Bigtable. So Cloud Bigtable. Um, is the same Bigtable service that Google uses internally behind, like I said, pretty much all uh, its apps, all its major apps have Bigtable uh, in their pedigree. Uh, but Cloud Bigtable is the externalization of that so that it produces a, a consumable consumer endpoint that our customers can use. Same SREs behind it, same you know, higher level of service, uh, but essentially you can use and build services to the scale and uh, sophistication of, for example, the services you see there. So why would you use it? You need something that's consistently fast, uh, fully managed, and infinitely scalable. So consistently fast, what does that mean? Essentially, single-digit millisecond retrievals gets, essentially, consistent, no matter how big the data size is. Uh, your P99 is always around six, uh, six milliseconds, always, uh, pretty much always under 10 milliseconds, and petabyte scale. Um, and so that the other implication there is that it's also for things that are sparsely populated. So if you're collecting attributes or dimensions or measures along um, certain keys or, uh, or certain elements, you don't necessarily have all of them or they're not all known ahead of time, um, then this helps facilitate that kind of model. These are the use cases that are becoming really popular. Uh, either they're currently popular in HBase or they're now getting popular on top of Cloud Bigtable. Uh, but anything where you're taking in millions upon millions of signals, um, perhaps refining those signals in, in terms of uh, updating them or expanding them or continuous measures of things. Um, some of the use cases we're going to talk about slowly. But keeping track of clicks, you know, particular user click, what was the property that they clicked on, or what, I mean, in terms of what was the internet property they clicked on, when did they click on it. All these are essentially dimensions that keep increasing and keep having some measure um, that you need to, uh, to, you need to stick with. Um, so here's a question. So if you have a, you know, a user database with uh, you know, keeping track of things like somebody's language that they want to see on their website and uh, you know, things that are in their shopping cart and your entire user database fits in about 50 gigs, that is a great use case for a traditional SQL system. This is not, uh, that's not a great candidate for uh, for a cloud Bigtable, so, or Bigtable in general. So it's important to sort of make sure that you're sizing the right, uh, the right backend technology. So I kind of liken it, like, like I said, you know, if somebody's in a user experience and they're not going to change, oh, I want to go from like German to English as a user preference. Um, and you, know, you take that for your entire user database and all your user preferences and it amounts to 50 gigabytes or you know, pick, a, pick a number. Um, that's a great use case for Cloud SQL, for Cloud Spanner, and something like that. It's not probably the, the right fit for um, Cloud Bigtable. Cloud Bigtable is specifically when you want to pick uh, precision accuracy. Uh, it's pretty simple to get started with the service. It's not, it's not too uh, encumbered. Uh, this is the UI example, but the CLI example is, is, uh, is, is equally trivial. Essentially, you just pick a name. So once you pick a name of your cluster, or an, uh, or once you create an instance, uh, you have a thing to address. Um, and that essentially gives the connection library a thing to connect to, uh, whatever you have named it. Uh, you pick a known, uh, you pick a zone. Uh, Cloud Bigtable is a zonal service. You pick a zone that it runs in. You need to pick a number of nodes. A minimum number of nodes is three. Um, and so that's again why there's a certain sort of minimum size that makes sense for data that you're going to put into uh, Cloud Bigtable. And then you'd pick basically SSD or HDD. SSD is uh, more expensive, but it's, it's more common. Uh, it's, it's a lower latency service. HDD would be a great example for things that are, you're going to have a much larger data set that's sparsely accessed. Um, so you, could, you can kind of decide. And if, if you really have a, a true use case where you kind of have both kinds of data, it might be efficient to create uh, two clusters in that case. 
Uh, clients, so I described you create a cluster, clients are going to connect in. Uh, they connect in really to sort of a load balanced tier, uh, an area, uh, essentially an endpoint that we give you as part of the service, and that routes to any number of Bigtable nodes. Uh, the nodes themselves, I'm going to just abstract that away for a second, but you connect to a node, the load balancing layer helps you, and that uh, the nodes themselves then retrieve and read and write their data from uh, Colossus from a storage system. So it's very important to understand that the storage within Bigtable is separate than the nodes. The nodes, you can think of it as like dials of throughput, how much throughput you have, and the storage is always in a heavily, heavily replicated, super durable file system that sits underneath. Um, I call nodes essentially custodian of keys, uh, so that when you want to access a particular key, you get routed to the node that's handling that key, and then that key essentially goes down to storage and gets it. Um, and essentially, data access looks like that. If you had five keys here, some nodes are handling any given division or segmentation of the population of keys. Um, and what that does is that um, as nodes become hot and begin transacting on keys, if there's hot issues with a key, like a key is getting access too much and it makes more sense to distribute which nodes are dealing with which keys, the service takes care of that. It's constantly learning access patterns and rebalancing as it needs to. Um, and similarly, since data is not actually stored on nodes, it's stored in a, in, a, in a storage system, it's stored in Colossus, if you want it to increase and go from three to four, that's a second's operation. It only takes a few seconds to do that because we're not really moving any data. We're simply bringing up a new node uh, which comes online within seconds, and then we're generally adjusting metadata of which nodes handle which uh, segmentation of the data. Um, it's important to understand that then the example I just talked about, adding nodes, um, that's a completely linear upward scale operation. And so every node can roughly take 10,000 uh, QPS, so that's what it's quoted at. Um, and so it's very linear. So if you have three nodes, which is a minimum cluster size, you're going to get 30,000 QPS. But that just keeps on going. So if you had essentially 30, that's um, 300,000, and um, 300, that's 3 million. Hopefully, I get the math right because it's on YouTube. So, uh, <laughs> but it is. We have a great talk last year where we were hitting, I think, 25 million QPS. Um, so, uh, and it was in last year's next. So, these are real numbers, and essentially, we have real customers doing these things at scale. Uh, again, with the spirit of just kind of how do you connect to it? So, we have a cluster, we have a name, we have a name of a thing that we can connect to, and it has size, and you know what you're reading and writing there. Uh, you can connect with an existing. So, if you have Asia based client, essentially the Java client, you can continue to use that. Uh, we put out a Go client, a Python client, and there's some community clients for things like Scala and um, .NET. But these are the clients that Google uh, specifically puts out. Uh, once you have a client, I mean, once you have a cluster and you have, say, for example, a HBase client or we provide a CLI, you can get in, and this is sort of like being in your administrative session inside of the databases where you can make tables inside your clusters. And then that CF stands for column family, and I'll talk about that in a second. But um, you have a cluster, you can connect to it, and then you can start to take on um, admin operations or admin plane operations inside of it. Uh, that's all stuff you can kind of take a look at. Um, so if you have an existing HBase deployment, things you're already doing in code in HBase, and you say, hey, uh, I want to take this HBase application, and how do I use it with Bigtable? Um, it's really simple. You simply change the connection string um, from being the HBase canonical connection factory to a Bigtable uh, connect uh, object, and then an additional import that just says that you're going to use a Bigtable configuration. That's, that's approach one. That's the simplest. Um, there's another approach which says, I don't want to touch my code. My code is running, or maybe I want to leave my code as agnostic, uh, which just means outside of your application code, you can essentially introduce a small uh, HBase site, XML, which basically populates your instance, your project ID. Hopefully, everybody knows what a project ID is now. Um, and, uh, and then you can choose to include that in your, in your build file. So bottom line, it's very, very easy to go make, them, make the switch from HBase to Cloud Bigtable. It's pretty trivial. Uh, moving up, kind of we're moving up from inception to what it is, to how to use it, uh, to what does it look like internally here. Um, the data model. The data model, it's uh, no SQL, no join, distributed key value store. So essentially, you have mechanisms to retrieve um, keys very, very fast. Uh, we'll talk about some other operations you can do on keys. But it's only one index. It's like having a, having a table with one index, which is essentially the row key, as it's called. Um, and you can do atomic operations inside of a particular row key, which means that basically if you decide to update something or decrement and increase something in, in the context of a particular uh, row key, then that works. But you can't do anything like, for example, join information for, that's in one key 
with another key, and nor can you um, say, let me, for example, decrement from uh, you know key A and and plenish it into key B. That would be like essentially a cross um, a cross key transaction. So again, you can do things within a key and know that that's consistent within that key, but not across keys. Um, and then it's sparse. So if you haven't written a particular column, like uh, then it's not taking up space. So you don't have to worry about that. In fact, that's, that's, that's encouraged. You know, if you haven't taken a particular reading type or you don't have a particular dimension on what you're reading, then, uh, then you don't have to worry about that being wasted space, much like you would perhaps see that as being wasted space in a traditional RDBMS system. So when you have a row key, there's a couple of things. There's, uh, actually, let me go back. I, I, let me, I skipped a section, sorry. So after the row key, you have this notion of column families that was in that previous when I showed the ace base shell. Um, so the column family is sort of like things that are roughly grouped together, um, which is just sort of like a macro qualifier on uh, individual smaller elements, which are called column qualifiers. And so if you wanted to refer to any given cell in, in this table, uh, you would specify the row key and then which column family in which column qualifier you're interested in, and essentially that zeroes you in on the exact element that you want to retrieve. Uh, the cells themselves, these individual cells, not you zeroed in on a cell, the cells themselves, say that fast, everybody together. So the cells themselves uh, are uh, versioned. So what that means is as you write data, the data has this sort of implied version, which is uh, N64, which is the t of, of flavor timestamp. You can technically make it anything you want, but the default is it's just a current timestamp. And so if you were to write the same um, cell again, uh, or do the same put uh, again, or do a put in the same uh, qualifier again, it would simply layer on, at the latest timestamp, uh, the new value, and the old ones would be there. Um, and by default, the old ones will get garbage collected at some point. And so that's why you can have a very high throughput that's very consistent. You can choose to have um, a retention policy that doesn't expire or you know, keeps n number of copies or something like that. Uh, but the default is you just keep layering up, and at some point, the old uh, versions get wiped away. So uh, what are the um, operations? Uh, so in terms of getting data in, You've got, you can do a put, it's a canonical put. You can put data in, which is putting one. Uh, you can increment, so you know, whatever the value is, then that happens on the server side where it can increment. Uh, append, where if you just want to canonically append something, uh, you can do conditional up updates. So if the value is x, then only if the value is x, I want to do y. Um, and then bulk import versus which by using some sort of uh, MapReduce process or data flow. Uh, getting data out, you can get. So get is basically just like, this is the row key. Get me that um, range scan, which says, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm basically going to start at this pattern, end at this pattern. I mean, range of, of a scan and this end. Uh, there's gonna, we're going to hear some very interesting things you can do with a range scan uh, towards the end of the talk. Um, filter, which basically means after I get this, I want to filter what I'm using. Um, full scan, literally, full scan is always the worst thing you can do in a database, uh, but it's from top to bottom, essentially, get me the whole thing. And then an export, again, using some bulk tools like. Um, MapReduce job or data flow. All right, so schema design. Um, uh, basic. So you have rows, you have row keys. Um, so you would store, you know, some of the big things here, I'll, I mean, I'll let you kind of glance through this. Some of this has already been talked about before. Um, but highlighting things like you want to avoid on your keys, you want to avoid things that are uh, monotomically increasing. So you want to avoid like choosing, for example, a timestamp or a sequence number or something that's always increasing because that will potentially create some hotspots in your architecture. Um, there's some strategies we'll talk about in a second to help avoid that. Um, the other is uh, if you're going to have something that's, you know, store things that are related to a particular entity in the same row. If you, if you can't do that because of some size or um, you, uh, for some other restrictions, then you can essentially think about splitting them up and using your key as a way to group like items to, uh, together. Um, store related entities together. Um, we're going to talk about that in a couple of slides as well. But just keep in mind, essentially, when you're, when you're talking, when you don't have a lot of knobs to turn in a, in a NoSQL system, what, what can you turn? Uh, those things that you can turn are essentially the row key and like how you design uh, how you pick your row key, and then what you're going to, you know, keep in your rows, and how how that information can be stored and retrieved. Um, 
and so what do I mean by that? So you have to start getting creative. So if I just say uh, memory uses as a, as a row key, it's going to be essentially an element that's always, uh, it's constantly receiving an update. And so it's going to create a certain hotness um, for that particular row key because it's pretty simplistic. So we do something here we call field promotion, which is uh, we take something that was originally a column and we shove it over to, to be uh, essentially combined with the row key. So in this case, if I take timestamp out of being a, simply a column, uh, our column data and move it and combine it with uh, what was the original name, which is memory usage, that helps a lot because now it's, 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 it's sort of added some variation to something that was a static, uh, a static element before. Um, and then, but the problem is even that timestamp then within that may start to get hot. Uh, and so you could think of, hey, if I take another field and promote that, which is user, and put that in, that essentially is basically like creating shards of the way you can query your data. So it doesn't uh, um, effectively create shards, but it basically helps distribute that data into discrete different locations within your system. There's other techniques too. This is called field promotion. This is the most popular one. Uh, we'll talk about that some more. Um, you could use randomization. You could use hashing. There's other things you can do. Um, but if, for example, if you choose to hash something, then just remember that that's, a, that's always going to be a client-side operation. You could choose to salt your keys. Um, there's different techniques here. This is the most prevalent one, which is to simply field promote. Um, and field promotion is interesting because then uh, what uh, what you could do is it sort of gives you know gives rise to just how creative you can be with that. So there's a design element here called tall versus wide tables. And so uh, in, a, in a wide table, essentially, you have an element. Um, this is a Prezi example that we use on our a social network involving presidents, which is um, kind of ironic nowadays. But anyways, uh, but if you had a, essentially, hey, for this given key, tell me everything about it, um, that's an example of a wide uh, table. I mean, your, your, the width of your table should generally have a horizon. Like, if it has no horizon, like keeping track, like, hey, I'm going to make a column for every single timestamp, and it just goes on and on and on, literally into infinity, that's not a good design choice. Because uh, essentially, row sizes should be kept in general, any given row size should be kept in general under uh, uh, 100 megabytes. So if you think that that's the case, then you probably want to change your schema a little bit, maybe break that up. Uh, instead of it being off into infinity, uh, maybe you say, well, my row key is some element and then the day. So at least that that row has some horizon that it's going to finish at. But having a row design that makes it so that you're always forever going to have uh, ever-expanding columns is a problem. Um, and then, so that's wide. Like, if you've got a query pattern, I'm going to ask this question. I want to know everything about it. Um, there's a different kind of question, which is, does this relationship exist? And the way you could kind of mimic this is to say, well, let me concatenate, for example, two elements. Let me see if they're, uh, they're related. Uh, like in this example, where the, the names have been hashed and concatenated together. And so if you were looking for that, you could just say, like, OK, get me this key. The absence of that key tells you that the relationship doesn't exist. And if you, in fact, get that key, then uh, the elements you'd retrieve would give you essentially the dictionary of all the items that you, that you would see that would tell you that not only the relationship exists, but everything coming back is what's relevant. Um, after everything I just told you, I will say, don't do that. So uh, there's so many, if you want to get that low level in terms of the, the data model and how to use it and how to incorporate it in your applications, by all means, do so. And, and there are a number of projects that come out. The best place to start is from the top down. If you're going to start using Cloud Big Table, uh, the best place to start is to say, is there a project framework, um, a piece of open source software that I can leverage uh, to help solve this problem that's already figured out how to do this effectively with, uh, with Bigtable, our NoSQL database. This is an example of them. Uh, graph databases is Janus Graph, uh, OpenTSDB we're about to hear about, and there's other time monitoring, um, uh, time series monitoring databases, GeoMesa we're going to hear about in a second too. And then on top of that, Google itself has deep integrations with some of our products. So with that, I would like to go into one of those use cases and ask David Mighton, who's co-founder and CEO of Server Density, to talk about time series. Thank you. Afternoon, everybody. So my name is David Mitten. I'm the co-founder and CEO at Server Density. And we do systems availability and performance monitoring. 
So we have an agent that exists on your servers, sends data into our system, and we also do availability monitoring from locations around the world to get that internal and external view. And everything you can see on this dashboard is essentially now powered by Google Cloud Bigtable. So the graphs, pulling out the latest values, um, generating calculations on uptime, this is all powered by our new integration um, with Bigtable. So what I'm going to talk you through is a quick run through of the old system. We've been in business for seven years, and the old system uh, lasted about six years. The challenges that we faced last year and why we decided to pick OpenTSDB and Bigtable as the time series storage engine. I'm going to talk a little bit about the migration, which we did without any customer downtime, how the new system looks, and then two lessons that we learned whilst we were doing the migration and the implementation. So the first language that I learned was PHP. And back in 2009, um, there were no time series databases um, that would work for us. Um, there was nothing available. There were no products, no, no services. And MongoDB um, was very new at the time. It was pre-version uh, 1 and worked really well at doing really fast writes had some really good drivers for the languages, and decided to use it as the time series data format storage um, system. So the way that this works is that data comes into us on a push basis. So you install the agent into your system. It sends data to us. It's just a JSON payload over HTTPS. It comes into our, our system, and then it goes into the queue. We played around with RabbitMQ and couldn't get it to scale over multiple data centers, so we implemented our own basic queuing system on top of MongoDB. That then passes it through into a rules engine, so when you configure your alerts, it looks at whether a threshold has been met and whether we need to trigger an alert or maybe close an already open alert. It then sends it off to a notification system, and I started Servidentity as a project to learn Python, which is what our monitoring agent is written in. And the notification system um, was written in Python, so that's sending emails, SMSs. And then the second route is to send it off into the time series data storage, which was MongoDB. So when you load a dashboard, it would query an internal API, which would then query Mongo and pull the data out. So this system scaled for us pretty well over six years. Rewrote it once and again evaluated the options and there were no real good solutions um, that were good enough to convince us to migrate. But early last year, we started hitting a couple of problems. So one of the problems that we've had over the years is that there's been no service available for a challenge or a problem that we've been hitting at scale. And so we've had to build a lot of custom implementations of things. And so we were spending a lot of time uh, maintaining that system, not only on the infrastructure, so it was running on bare metal servers, uh, it was running at software, and uh, not only on the infrastructure itself in terms of the servers, but also all the custom code that we had to write to do things like pulling data and, and displaying graphs, uh, calculating maths functions on, on the data, sums, averages, that kind of stuff. We had to build it all ourselves. And that's not a good use of our time when we're a relatively small company, 20 people now, but um, that's grown gradually, organically, as, as the company has scaled. And it's not a good use of our time to be building what's essentially undifferentiated heavy lifting. We also had problems with scaling it. MongoDB does scale, contrary to popular belief, but you have to put a lot of time into managing the shards and managing the replication. And in particular, when you add a new uh, replica set, you've got to migrate that data over to it, which does have an impact. And then keeping all of this data in memory so that when you're loading your dashboard, the graphs load within a second. And the typical use case is loading data from uh, the last day um, or so. And so we have to keep that data in memory to make it fast. And then slightly older data goes onto SSDs because hard disks are just too slow. And this is actually really expensive. Even with modern pricing, having really high spec servers uh, is not cheap. And we had many terabytes of RAM and many hundreds of terabytes of SSDs just to store this data. So we did an evaluation. We looked at different options. And there are a couple of different things that we could have used. But we ultimately selected OpenTSDB 
and our big table is the storage engine for a couple of reasons. So the first of these is that it is a managed service. We're a small team, and we don't want to be spending time managing the underlying infrastructure. So we don't want to be upgrading RAM. We don't want to have to put in tickets to get RAM upgraded. We don't want to have to deal with disk failures, all of the stuff that um, is just not a good use of our time. Bigtable is a completely managed service, and so uh, this is one of the selling points. Now, OpenTSDB is an actively developed project. It's open source. And there's a lot of functionality built into the product that meant that we wouldn't have to build it. And there's a few things that we've contributed upstream, a couple of fixes. Uh, but for the most part, it's feature complete from, for what we need. We also get linear scalability. And this is a really important point for planning, because we can just add new nodes. And we know we're going to get an additional 10,000 QPS. So this makes it really easy to understand how much more capacity we need and when, and exactly how much it's going to cost, because each node is a fixed cost. And it's a specialist data store. Bigtable is specifically designed for time series data. And so all of these combined means it can be significantly more efficient than moving MongoDB over to um, Compute Engine, for example, or using a generic um, SQL database. The whole point of Bigtable is to store this exact kind of data. So the migration. Now, as a monitoring product, it needs to be up. It needs to be available. And we run on the principle that your monitoring should be more reliable than the infrastructure it is actually monitoring. So this meant we couldn't have a period of downtime whilst we move the data over. Also, we're migrating across two different environments, between software over to Google. And we looked at a couple of different options, um, including VPNs and Direct Connect, which are good options, but ultimately settled on just sending it over the internet. And this is because all the internal systems within Servidentity are microservices. So we could just extract it, put it into Google Cloud, and expose it over HTTPS with, of course, the appropriate uh, whitelisting for our IPs and have the data going over the internet with minimal latency. And we're able to pick a zone very close to the software data center. With two systems running, we needed to write the data from the production environment on software into Google. And this has to happen at the exact same time. We picked a date. We went live with, uh, with Bigtable, but behind the scenes. So customers were still using the old system, but data was being written into both. And from that point, all the historical data, so going backwards, could then be migrated um, in our own time frame. And so we picked the historical data, sent it over to, uh, to Bigtable, and then flipped a feature flag, which meant that the, write, the reads went over. So the writes were always going, but then the reads were going on a per customer basis. So as we completed each migration, we uh, flipped that flag, and customers were then having their reads go over to Bigtable. And despite this connectivity over the internet, we got significantly better performance. And the graphs, whatever time range you might pick, from 30 minutes to 30 months, we get pretty much the exact same load, uh, loading time, despite the latency um, of going over the internet. And of course, we're a monitoring company, so we had detailed metrics so that we could compare the performance before and after. And this allowed us to verify that the, app, the, the migration from our testing over into production um, was uh, working as expected, but also allowed us to pick out a, a, an interesting design flaw, which I'll show you in a moment. So this is the new system. We also took some time about two years ago to get rid of that MongoDB queuing system, get rid of PHP, and replace it with a proper system. So that's Kafka and Storm. Uh, today, we might look at Google. Uh, Cloud PubSub, but it wasn't available at the time we started that project. Kafka is a great, uh, great queuing system, and we were able to just port in our Python code. Uh, we wrote it from PHP into Python into Storm because it has a wrapper, so it doesn't have to be in Java. The flow is then the same. So it goes through the rules engine, which was also rewritten into Python, so it's done properly, and notifications very similar as well. And that remains on the soft layer side. It's still there today. Over the next couple of months, we're moving everything over to Google Cloud. But the Big Table project was the first one uh, that allowed us to move over this really core part of the product. And then 
on the Google Cloud side of things, because it's a microservice, the API itself for querying the graphs, so if you load up our interface and you inspect the code um, in the console, you'll be able to see the internal API requests that are happening. And this hits the Google Load Balancer, then connects into OpenTSDB. And this runs on Container Engine because it is itself stateless and allows us to scale it as we need to. It runs on containers. And that has an official connector which allows OpenTSDB to use Bigtable as the storage engine. And then we deploy this across multiple zones and so that we get the redundancy. Now, two interesting lessons that we learned. Now, during our testing and the development phase, we span up um, the Bigtable cluster and started sending in some writes so that we could test to see what the performance was and how it would work. And we were very quickly dismayed to see that our estimations were blown completely out of the water in terms of uh, the number of requests that we would need. And more or less, every single metric that we were writing was calling a single API call on Bigtable. This is just a subset. It's not our full workload. So we were seeing very quickly 60,000 uh, requests per second into Bigtable. And because you pay, uh, on a per node basis, and each node gives you 10,000 requests, our estimations of what we would actually need to do um, were completely incorrect. Now, after talking with the Google support team, uh, we discovered that OpenTSDB shipped with an outdated version of the driver, and we were able to update to a development version which significantly reduced the number of API calls because it had introduced a new feature that allows you to batch those calls. So we're still writing the same amount of data but we were able to go from 60,000 API calls per second down to three. And that allowed us to half the node size and half the cost of this test and meant that our estimations were indeed correct and we could continue with the project. So the lesson learned here is uh, stay with the latest version of the driver and also test with development versions because the official supported latest version might actually be out of date. And Google's technical support are really good at helping with diagnose these kind of problems. The second one is a little more complicated. We found this after we'd put, after we'd completed the migration, because we tested with small accounts. We have some customers who are monitoring huge numbers of servers, and we found that the row keys that you set, uh, it's really important to ensure that you have the correct cardinality when scanning rows. And the first approach that we took resulted in too many scans. And every account has a unique ID and metric name like load average or disk usage. And that was the original key design. But by querying on that, it meant that we had to not only scan, but filter the met that metric for all devices. So a query on a particular device for, say, system load had to scan and filter um, every single metric for every single device on the account. And this meant that the number of scan rows was the number of devices multiplied by the time range. So for big accounts, all the devices for that account uh, would get queried and scanned. And this reduced the, uh, the performance of the system as the customer got bigger. And we discovered this with our monitoring once we started to go to production uh, to test that. So we refactored the key so that only very specific devices are queried. So we went from the account ID and the metric name uh, to include the item ID. So an item is a server or a URL, and we included that in the key itself. Now, tag filtering in OpenTSDB can still reduce performance because it uh, increases the amount of filtering that needs to be done. So you have to be careful with that, but it meant that where uh, instead of going from um, querying every single uh, row, the scan only has to do um, based on it has to do it based on the time range. So this is what it looks like with the refactored key design. And if we compare it to the original key design, you can see that the amount of data that has to be scanned is significantly reduced. So in the end, we were able to migrate everything over. We've just completed the migration and have a linearly scalable system, which has high availability across multiple zones, allows us to build new product features because we don't have to deal with any of the operational overhead of running servers, 
and building features that just don't differentiate on uh, just the standard level. And we get that with lower costs. And we're able to reduce our costs of running bare metal um, along with MongoDB by three times by migrating over. Now, the original code was written by me, and I had real engineers to rewrite it. And these are the, the guys on the team who did that work, um, worked with our operations team and our engineers, and also the Bigtable engineering team, and of course, OpenTSDB. So I wanted to say thanks to those, those people and just show exactly what this powers. It powers our Apple TV app, powers our mobile app, and of course, the graphing within the product itself. All right, so I'm going to hand you over to Anthony Fox now. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so my name is Anthony Fox. Uh, I'm from uh, Virginia, where I work for a small analytics-focused company called CCRI. And I'm going to be talking today about GeoMesa and how you can use open source uh, to manage spatiotemporal data on top of Bigtable and also on top of some other Google Cloud uh, architectural components. So just a level set. Traditional GIS spatial data um, is things like points, lines, and polygons. So natural features, uh, geographic features, uh, political boundaries, those things that are fairly static and not very big, not necessarily the best use case on top of big table, though you could use that. There's also uh, a huge amount of satellite imagery that is being produced every single day. As part of the keynote, we heard that Planet Labs was imaging the entire Earth uh, every three or four hours, I think, which is producing an enormous amount of data. But then there's also the data that we're going to focus on today, which is the kind of data that companies like Exact Earth uh, collect. And this is a growing area of uh, data, spatiotemporal data. So this is a visualization of uh, the data that Exact Earth collects from their constellation of satellites. This is AIS data. AIS stands for the Automatic Identification System. It's a uh, protocol that all marine vessels broadcast their location on every six seconds. So every vessel in the world broadcasts their location every six seconds. And uh, um, Exact Earth's uh, satellites pick that up as they spin around the globe and downlink that to uh, navigation systems, safety systems, routing systems, all kinds of other systems. And in addition, there's, so there's the satellite collected data, but then there's uh, data collected from connected devices. So the data that uh, an organization like Strava collects, so Strava is a uh, social media application for fitness activities. Strava, so Exact Earth collects maritime data every six seconds. Uh, it produces, I think, right now about 8 million records a day. And they're launching a whole suite of new satellites where they're going to collect orders of magnitude more than that. Strava collects uh, every second a measurement is taken for each activity. Uh, and that measurement has things like heart rate, elevation, uh, time, location. Uh, so they produce a lot of data per activity and then across all of the activities. These are some density maps that we produced from ingesting Strava data into GeoMesa. This is uh, commutes in downtown San Francisco, which pretty much covers the, all of the roads in downtown uh, San Francisco. So spatiotemporal data uh, is growing. The volumes of it is growing. It's very high velocity. In order to manage it, I, I'm one of the original founders of the open source GeoMesa project, which is a, uh, an Eclipse Foundation location tech working group open source project. It's a toolkit um, for managing and analyzing spatiotemporal data, both at rest and in stream. For managing and analyzing the data at rest, it has integrations with Cassandra, HBase, Accumulo, and the original uh, big, uh, the original NoSQL database, Bigtable, which we're going to talk in detail about. For uh, streaming data, it has integration with um, Apache Kafka. It's actually the same API that it exposes on top of Bigtable. It exposes on top of Kafka, which is kind of interesting. And for analyzing the data, it has fairly deep integration with Spark SQL um, for doing spatiotemporal operations. OK, so. Now we're going to deep dive into how you might index data 
spatiotemporal data in Bigtable. So remember, Bigtable has one index. It's a, it's a sorted, lexicographically sorted key. So as an example of what you shouldn't do, uh, consider if you concatenated latitude and longitude. So your row key becomes what you see there. This is the Moscone Center's uh, latitude and longitude. 37.7839 comma negative 122.4012. The typical query that you're going to make is going to bound those dimensions. So you're going to look for things around the Moscone Center. And if you do that and you scan Big Table's lexicographically sorted index, you're going to get uh, data points that are near Fukushima, Japan, because they happen to share the same latitude and they sort lexicographically near each other. So data that is very far apart in physical space is close in big table index space, and that's not good. So we don't want to do that. So we have to be a little bit more clever than that. And so we use something uh, called space filling curves. So there's lots of different kinds of space filling curves. The whole point of a space filling curve is to encode multiple dimensions into a single dimension so that uh, um, nearness is maintained. So things that are near each other in physical space are near each other in index space. So here's a couple of examples. On the far right, you have um, the Hilbert curve, and you have multiple iterations of the Hilbert curve. Uh, the Hilbert curve has great locality. On the left, you've got the z-order curve, which is incredibly simple, and so we're going to walk through a deeper dive of the z-order curve. There's also an interesting library that Google has put out called S2, which treats the spherical Earth as a, um, a cube and then overlays a space filling curve in each one of those faces and in doing so minimizes the distortion that is typical of map projections. All right, so let's walk through the simplest space filling curve and how it gets used so you get some intuition for how you produce these keys. So we're going to uh, encode the coordinates of the Moscone Center into a 32-bit integer, Z index. So we have 32 bits. We have two dimensions, so 16 bits per dimension. We're going to scale the latitude and longitude coordinates, their bounded dimensions. So for instance, longitude is bounded negative 180 to 180. We're going to map negative 180 to 0 and 180 to 2 to the 16th. We'll do the same scaling for uh, the latitude. And we have integer uh, representations of our um, x and y coordinates. Then we take the binary representation, so there's 16-bit strings, essentially, interleave those, convert it back to an integer, and that's our big table key. And so what we've effectively done is we've linearized this multidimensional space. So in this chart, on the right, you can see a kind of conceptual notion of a big table index going from 0 to 2 to the 32. And the point on that index where the Moscone Center lands in index space. What's really nice about this is that things that are near each other sort near each other in big table. And region queries, which is your 95% you know, use case spatiotemporal query, turns into a range scan. So the range that you're looking at there for that box is just a scan from a starting integer to an ending integer. And we get the uh, magic of big table handling of partitioning and, and um, load balancing for free because we have this uh, nice machinery behind this uh, structure that we've set up. So if we jump back, there's some additional properties to wrap up on space filling curves. Uh, they have this recursive structure. So uh, if you look at the z-order curve, uh, the, first, um, the first picture is two bits, right? So it has this quad tree um, decomposition. And you start adding more bits, but you can do these common prefix scans, which is one of the, the things that Bigtable is best at. And those prefix scans map to uh, regions on the Earth. They naturally extend to higher order dimensions with just a few tricks here and there. So you can encode time into uh, the Z order curve, and you get a Z3 curve or a, a three dimensional Hilbert curve. And there's some extensions to Z order curves that um, allow you to index uh, non point geometry, so geometries with spatial extent like line strings and polygons. So that covers 
the basics of how you use a space filling curve in conjunction with big tables model. Uh, so one, another thing that I'd like to talk about, something that we've spent a lot of time in, in GeoMesa, but I think is a natural evolution of a, um, a developer working with Bigtable. Uh, in Bigtable, you have this one index. Uh, so you design your table structure so that it maps to the query patterns that you expect, and you make those query patterns really, really fast. That's really good. You feel good about that, and then suddenly your users start doing different query patterns, and you realize that your index structure is good for some queries, but terrible for other queries. So uh, much as you add an index in a relational database, in Bigtable, adding an index uh, amounts to redundantly storing your data in another table with a different index structure. And then, so, it, so in this query example that I'm showing here uh, from a Strava table, uh, there is a uh, spatial predicate, the ST contains, and an athlete ID predicate. You don't want to scan all of the data that matches that spatial predicate and filter it down to the athlete ID. You want an index on athlete ID, so those are really fast. So in GeoMesa, we have a, um, a query planner that will inspect the query and find the, uh, the predicate that has the least cost in query execution and dispatch the query to that index, in this case, the Strava Activities Index, uh, and then apply spatial predicate po filtering in a post-processing phase. This is a typical pattern. So either you use this through a library or it's something that you can adopt as you uh, begin to engage with Bigtable. OK, so we've covered spatial indexing. We've covered redundantly storing your data with multiple index structures. What about analytical workloads? So we, he we heard that there's no query time joins in Bigtable, but you still want to answer questions like in the exact Earth's use case, what is the optimal time of day to traverse the Panama Canal? It, it takes, I think, on the order of seven to eight hours to traverse the Panama Canal. So picking the right time can be a, a big cost savings. So that's a kind of analytical query that you might ask uh, of exact Earth's data. An analytical query you might ask of Strava's data is, what are the typical commuter routes uh, for workplaces in downtown San Francisco. These are joins and aggregations that Bigtable just doesn't provide at query time. But Bigtable does support loading your data uh, out of Bigtable and into something like Spark. So you can use this Spark SQL in conjunction with Google Cloud uh, Data Proc to recover the ability to do joins and aggregations and, and execute analytical workloads on top of your big table data. And GeoMesa adds a bunch of uh, extensions to Spark SQL, including geometry types, spatial predicates, and uh, geometry processing functions. So let's uh, dissect an analytical query and see how the whole uh, suite of Google Cloud products um, allows you to execute this particular workload. So this is the Panama Canal query. We've got aggregations, averaging, counts, group buys. We've got geospatial predicates. In this case, it's ST contains. We want to filter down to things that are around Panama Canal. We've got geometry types. We're, we're creating a polygon predicate on, a, uh, on our geometry column within Bigtable. So what happens is you spin up a data proc uh, cluster of whatever size elastically scaled to the workload that you expect for that particular use case. You submit your Spark SQL uh, query, and GeoMace's extensions intercept the query, discover the spatial predicate, and use the spatial predicate to compute the ranges out of Bigtable that they'll use to provision the RDD. So only the data that matches that predicate will come into the Spark in-memory runtime. And at that point, Spark then spins and does its aggregations and group by uh, operations. So we've been able to recover this analytical workload capability by leveraging additional components of the Google suite. And you'll discover that you should time your traversal of the Panama Canal to about 0600 uh, GMT, which is the least trafficked hour of the day. So uh, that uh, covers what I was going to talk about today. Um, as a note, 
Uh, this particular slide is out of date. It says 131 snapshot, but the release was cut. 131 was cut maybe an hour ago, so it's just in time. Uh, those are my coordinates for uh, contacting me. This is available now. Um, yeah, thank you.